Hey there, good morning. We'll continue right along with our book club for Bayes rules. From the very beginning it, uh, for Bayesian thought, we've been thinking about our prior distributions, our data, and updating to our posterior distributions. And we have spent a chapter or two talking about some nice situations called conjugate families where we could understand or know the shape of the distribution or the posterior distribution in advance. However, there were probably many times when the situations don't work out so nicely. And we're going to kind of expand our abilities for a, a larger variety of situations. So today, chapter six, approximating the posterior distribution. We are going to implement and examine the limitations using grid approximation to simulate the posterior model. We're going to explore Monte Markov chain Monte Carlo posterior simulations using an R package. And we're going to learn several Markov chain diagnostics. That way we can examine the quality of our MCMC posterior simulations. Note that in the way this textbook is formed, I think it, it's a neat idea. And here in chapter six, we're going to kind of get an overview of what MCMC is doing for us and maybe wait until chapter seven to see the actual calculations and the inner workings of the MCMC processes. So to be a little more precise, remember that we're trying to compute the posterior distribution, the aspect of the formula that's on the left side of the equation there. In the previous examples with the conjugate priors, we were able to do this analytically. For example, with the beta binomial conjugate prior, we knew that after we went through the whole process, we would end up back with another beta distribution. Or the gamma Poisson conjugate prior, after all the calculations, we knew we would be back to a gamma distribution and similarly for a normal normal. There in the top right of the formula was the numerator when we multiply the likelihood and by its uh, conditional. We have no issues with the calculations. However, what we were concerned about towards the end of the last chapter and then coming into this chapter is the denominator, where we, because likelihoods do not add up themselves to 100%, we need to normalize the situation. It's just that now that we don't necessarily have a discrete distribution, such as a binomial or Poisson process, and when we go into a continuous distribution, in theory, we have an infinite number of data points to consider, or what mathematicians call a dense situation. Moreover, as we broaden our scope for, of applications, we might be considering using more than one variable. So in some silly sense, that is uh, multiple copies of infinity. And thus the denominator might be, at least in theory, uh, very difficult to compute. And we might find also that maybe based on our workflow, we do not need to compute everything. So instead, we're going to ap approximate the posterior distribution through simulations. And you've probably seen this come up elsewhere in mathematics such as if you take in calculus courses, you realize that the antiderivative or the integral is a, a nice concept to counter derivatives and can come up in various equations themselves called integral equations. However, the skills that you learn in the calculus course might not apply to every single integral that you encounter. Or perhaps there are some integrals that are so complicated, you would not want to solve them by hand anyways. We could approximate them and get decent answers, whatever decent may mean to you. Uh, similarly for Taylor's 
hate her series, but now I'm just rambling. I like how the textbook gives the viewer an analogy about what grid approximation is before we really get into it. I thought I'd offer another one here. So here in the first image, you could kind of get a sense of what I'm trying to show you. It's apparently the picture of our textbook, but I've intentionally downsampled the image by a factor of four. So we kind of got a blurry picture, maybe could read the words depending on um, how confident you are in reading what's being shown to you at the moment. Now, as we go down to this middle picture here, I took the original and downsampled it by two. You can see that the picture is coming into view. It's a little more clear, a little more um, crisp. But depending on your computer screen and where you're at right now, you might notice that the text is kind of blurry at the moment. And then finally, this is the original picture here. So the quality of the original picture is obviously the nicest out of the ones I've shown you right now. But we also have some considerations in image processing, say in this example, you don't necessarily need to tell people exactly where every red dot is. And the funny thing about words is you don't necessarily need to tell people what every letter is either. And people's minds will fill, fill in what the words are. So there might be situations where you could get away with a lower quality version of your image of your product and it might be good enough to express the information. So we'll see about grid approximation. We're gonna discretize the approximation of the posterior. Uh, if you don't automatically understand the mathematics behind that, that's fine. We'll see you a graph in just a few minutes here. To give us an outline though, our method of producing samples includes, we're gonna define a grid of possible values for the parameters, evaluate the numerator of our Bayes rule at each possible value. Now, because we're not gonna, in theory, compute an infinite amount of values, we're gonna have a, a relatively small finite amount of computations, we could normalize the results by divided by the sum. And then for the posterior itself, uh, multiplying the prior times the likelihood, we will randomly sample the grid values. As you see in the outline on the left-hand side, we'll spend some time with the beta binomial distribution once again and see how this all works out. So let's think of a beta distribution, a beta prior, maybe with hyperparameters 2, 2. And then we'll um, pretend we're going through some data and go through that evaluation step using the binomial distribution looking at 10 observations with some unknown parameter pi. Now, with the beta distribution as such, we recall that we could get the expected value, the average, and at the moment, from the values going between zero and one, we are setting our expected value in the middle at 0.5. These make it sense. It's a good guess. In our example, though, we go through 10 trials and we notice that success happens in nine of the 10. So remember how that will affect things as we move towards the posterior distribution. <laughs> 
quick, we're going through some R code. We're going to guess values for the probability pi between zero and one. And let's guess at maybe 100 locations. So 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, all the way up to 1.0. With that grid data, we're going to run through our prior distribution be formed by the beta distribution, again with hyperparameters 2, 2. Our likelihood at all 100 of those values will th then be um, calculated through the binomial distribution, k equals 9, n equals 10. And in the numerator of Bayes' rule, we'll have our unnormalized version of our calculations being the prior times the likelihood. To get things back down to a probability distributions where all the probabilities add up to 100%, we take the unnormalized version and divide by its sum, and that will be our posterior distribution. This is a nice image here that the textbook authors and the folks who made this book club have produced for us. So once again, we are running through the simulations at 100 values of pi there on the horizontal axis. Started with a beta 2-2 distribution of observed 9 out of 10 successes. And through the binomial distribution, ran, ran through Bayes' rule, we are now left with another beta distribution because of how the conjugate uh, family worked out. And we noticed this time around that the beta distribution that we have here in the posterior is skewed left or um, pushed towards your right. which should align with our intuition because the data was nine out of 10 success rate. And some neat work with geom segment from the ggplot package. To verify that this worked out, the textbook uh, then goes to some sampling with the grid data, but instead of randomly selecting numbers from a uniform distribution, which we might do by default, we could set the weights so that we have more weights to where in the image you see more density. And with the sampling procedure where we go through that maybe 10,000 times, we get this histogram, the rectangles. Now through the work of the conjugate families, we know we're supposed to end up with a beta distribution with parameters 11 and three, and that's what's in the smooth curve here in the image. We could argue that the sampling dissimulation seemed to line up well with the theoretical answer. The, the sampling being the rectangles and the theoretical answer being the smooth density curve. Finally, uh, with the 11.3 beta distribution, we note that the new expected value in the posterior should be about 79%. Okay, so let's move on to a topic called Monte Carlo. I always uh, mess it up. Let's move on to a topic called Markov chain Monte Carlo. The textbook uh, notes some of the background information of what scientists think about at this point. We have the cursor dimensionality, especially when we deal with more than, say, one or two variables. This grid approximation is limited in its usefulness to cases when there's only a few parameters. Uh, basically, when you have 
when you start to go into many dimensions, the probabilities towards the tails are much harder to achieve, but that's not necessarily your intention. So you have to kind of worry about that. In general, the broad mathematical concept is called a stochastic process, and that's a sequence of random variables, a sequence of randomness. A lot of work is attributed to a Russian mathematician named Markov. This was maybe about 80 years ago. And the Markov chain makes an assumption that dependence only, uh, only applies or only, um, sorry, that the information is only dependent on the previous element in the sequence. Which at first sounds um, pretty limiting, but considering we're studying Markov chains uh, quite often here decades later, you could imagine that their usefulness became pretty prevalent. Around the same time in American think tanks, scientists were describing some of their uh, processes as Monte Carlo methods, um, you taking advantage of randomness and seeing uh, if something useful comes about, called Monte Carlo after a famous casino in the south of Europe. So combined, we call this Markov chain Monte Carlo. We're going to produce Markov chains to approximate the posterior distribution. And it, 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 it's strange to me how this all works out, because if we look at these last bullet points here, the samples are not directly from the posterior distribution, and they're not independent either. So some of our notions of sampling from other statistics concepts uh, might have assumed independence, but because stochastic processes inherently have dependence between elements in the list, we have to kind of change our way of thought. But before we get too deep into the Markov chains and how that works mathematically, we'll, we'll just kind of wait on that uh, for another week. We'll see how it works out in the next chapter. But let's go ahead and see how this works out computationally or in our computer code using the R stand package. We'll run this Monte. We'll run this Markov chain Monte Carlo idea on the beta binomial conjugate family. The code that the R stand package, in my opinion, the code that the R stand package wants is particular. So we'll be be careful how we type this in. For the data themselves, this is the binomial distribution part of the conjugate family. We are dealing with a discrete distribution, and we had a sample size of 10. So the number of successes could be an integer between 0 and 10, and that was the capital Y in our model. That, that was um, the capital Y in this setup here. For the underlying variable or parameter, that was pi. We call that pi could take on any real number between 0 and 1. So notice that real number instead of integer, we or just being careful with our setup here. And then our conjugate family model, and the models themselves do not have to be conjugate families. So I, I should correct myself there. Remember our data is going to be simulated through a binomial distribution based on the various values of probability pi, where pi itself started with a prior distribution here, the beta 2-2 model. Now, as of this video, I wanted to point out that the R stand package 
is not completely compatible with our version 4.2. So if anybody is following along, make sure that you install the R stand package from source, the, the most up-to-date version before trying out these simulations. We're going to run the main function from the R stand package to create our model here in the beta binomial setting. For whatever Markov chains are, we're going to create only four of them. This could be very computationally intense. And as we're getting used to some of these concepts, you probably don't want to have your computer spend much time on the computations. So maybe four chains for now. The chains that we seek will be about 5,000 elements long. I will explain this times two in, a, in just a second. And because we do have some randomness in our simulations, once again, the textbook authors get cutesy and decide that their seeds should correspond to the word bays, at least in some really old telephone code. You do not necessarily have to look at the output of this band calculation, but since we only grab four chains, I thought it would be useful to take a glance at what's going on here. So once again, we have four chains. On my computer, each chain took about rounding up about one second to compute. There's a warning to double check your expectations and we'll get to that towards the end of the chapter here. Now, notice that the textbook author said that we're gonna be seeking chains of length of about 5,000, but you actually double that in your request for the number of iterations. What Markov chains are doing is they're kind of bouncing around between numbers, numbers between zero and one. They're, they're bouncing around back and forth in some way. And folks who deal with this stuff say that you should give the program some quote unquote time to warm up. So, so the first 5,000 calculations or so, we're, we're actually going to throw those out. We're, we're not even going to worry about them. And then we're going to actually examine the second half, the second group of 5,000. And that's true for each of the four chains that we just asked the computer to compute. The results are called a stand fit object. And like other data analyses in R, you could um, extract some information as such. For example, if you make the Stanford object into an array and into a data frame, for folks like me, that makes sense. And then we could do things such as graph it. So here, the Markov chain Monte Carlo trace function which I believe is coming from the Bayes model package. We could uh, loosely see what the four chains are doing, and that's what I mean by the bouncing back and forth action. The funny thing is, when we look at these pictures of Markov chains, we're actually hoping for boring situations. If the shape of the graph, if uh, thinking about your statistics class and the sections about linear regression, for here, if the shape of the graph had some sort of downwards trend or upwards trend, like you would see in some linear regression examples, or something else, maybe like a sine wave or a parabola, if there was some apparent underlying pattern, that's actually bad for what we're talking about today. So we're actually hoping for a boring picture when we examine our MCMC -MC results. <laughs> 
for the density itself of the of the values as they bounce back and forth. You could see here in the first graph the values for pi um, from zero to one tended to be relatively large, tended to be over uh, fifty percent. And when we grab the density plot, we could visually see that this is aligning with the posterior distribution that we ex expected, the beta 11.3 distribution. For practice, the textbook then goes into another example, this time using the gamma Poisson MCMC. For the Poisson distribution, how we grab or run through the data. Remember, the Poisson distribution itself is another discrete probability distribution. So we're looking at integers there. It's just that we don't know what the maximum number is. So fortunately, the folks who made our stand made this adaptable to the Poisson distribution, where, again, we do not know the maximum. The parameter is going to be called lambda. In this case, it's going to be a real number. And then the Poisson gamma conjugate family will assume a prior distribution of a gamma 3, 1. And then the data will be computed through the Poisson distribution. We'll call this the GP model for gamma, gamma Poisson. In the example, they have possible values for the number of successes in the Poisson distribution, which let's say maybe two and maybe eight to see what happens. Once again, just for textbook study for us students, let's keep the computation numbers relatively low, study maybe four chains, seeking chains of lengths 5,000, but because of the warm up period, double that. And the uh, base seed, if, if you like that. This one took my computer a relatively longer amount of time. So just be wary of the computation time. So this time around was the four chains. Once again, it is intentional. We're getting a quote unquote, like boring picture. We don't want anything extra to be happening here in our MCMC -MC trace. These um, stand fit objects, we could also run this through other helper functions, such as making a histogram of the possible values for our parameter for our lambda. So here we get a histogram that's kind of giving us a sense of what our posterior distribution will look like for the parameter. Or, or likewise, because the gamma distribution is a continuous distribution, might as well kick up the complexity to a density plot. And we'll have this here, which should line up with where the gamma distribution would end up analytically. So that is to say, through some initial forays into the R stand package and running through some calculations after we build a model. It looks like for the beta binomial conjugate family and now for the gamma Poisson conjugate family, the calculations are working out as expected. However, once we go beyond conjugate families, once we go beyond situations where we are completely comfortable in knowing what the answer should be, we are going to maybe produce MCMC -MC chains in our own work, but in situations where we do not know 
much about the answers at, at all. And that's why we're doing these calculations in the first place. And thus, we should address the question of how do we know if a Markov chain Monte Carlo process is good? Or perhaps maybe there's something wrong with our modeling process in the first place. The textbook walks us through four possible tools that we could use along the way. It's analogous to when you're doing hypothesis testing elsewhere in statistical software. You are told by your statistics teacher or your research co collaborators that you maybe should ch check for things like um, normality of the residuals. You should maybe check for heteroscedasticity uh, and things like that. Analogously, we will uh, look at these tools for our MCMC. So far, we've been looking at trace plots, literally graphing the, the MCMC chains here in this picture, there are four chains. Once again, after we actually double the, the length of what we want because the first 5,000 elements of the chains might not have um, quote unquote settled into this shape here. So in this picture, we actually did not graph the first 5,000 elements. We're only graphing the second half, the second group of 5,000, where the Markov chains have hopefully kind of started to condense or settle into some location, which in the distributions, when I mean settled in a location, I mean places where there's more density, as opposed to still looking at a bunch of numbers everywhere in the zero to one interval. Thus, in simpler words, when we look at trace plots, we're hoping for an image like this. There is a notion called effective sample size. And with multiple chains going on, long story short, we are double checking some of the correlation between the samples. And the folks who work on MCMC quite often recommend that for whatever this calculation is doing, you're hoping for an answer that's above 0 0.1. So since this is above 0 0.1, this check for effective sample size seems to be doing pretty well. We, in our simulation of the beta binomial conjugate family, produce four chains. Here we could use the helper function to put all four density functions on the same graph. And they seem to agree with each other in what they're trying to do. They are each implying the same posterior distribution. Autocorrelation, correlation itself is, as you know, uh, trying to get a sense of a possible relationship between a couple of variables. Autocorrelation, the prefix auto means you're actually seeking correlation versus the, the same vector of data. And what we tend to do is look at lag steps. Do the values correlate well with what they saw one step behind, maybe two steps back in the sequence, maybe three steps back in the sequence. And when you look at autocorrelation graphs, you want to see situations like what we have here with the four chains, where the graph um, decreases quite quickly and, and goes into that horizontal asymptote. This is especially true for Markov chains, because remember the Markov assumption is that our behavior is only dependent on the previous item. 
So we should only see correlation or mainly only see correlation one step back in the process. Finally, R hat um, analogous to the R squared calculations in regression. R hat is the ratio of variability between chains and variability within chains. Long story short, we're, we hope that R hat values um, are close to 1.0, that these variability between and within are about the same. However, the folks who deal with MCMC quite often advise that if the R hat value is bigger than 1.05, then there might be something wrong with the model or the usage of the model. Here in the beta binomial uh, simulations, we get an R hat that is indeed close to 1.0. So what I thought I'd do from here is in addition to showing you images of the diagnostics for when a situation is good, we should probably contrast this in a situation that is bad in some sense. Now, admittedly, I was watching the movie Top Gun Maverick last night, and I just went ahead and called this section the danger zone. I mentioned earlier uh, when the Markov chain Monte Carlo process starts, the numbers bounce around quite more rapidly than what we want later on. So what we're going to do here on this page is we're going to actually just grab a much shorter version of the MCMC. Maybe look at of chain lengths of 50 instead of 5,000. So, so literally only 1% as long as the examples we saw before. Notice that uh, R is already giving us some warnings. So that's one sign that this is going to go uh, badly for us. This time around, when we see the MCMC trace, arguably the processes are bouncing around much more rapidly than what we want. Because remember, the, the whole point is to try to get a sense of the posterior distribution, which, um, at least in the examples we've seen today, should have a pretty obvious mode, a pretty obvious um, density of where we probably should be. We built four chains once again, laying the four density plots on top of each other. You can see here in the early goings of the MCMC process, the agreement or what we should have as agreement between the chains is not as apparent yet. They're not quite lined up as much in how they're trying to guess what the posterior distribution is. For the autocorrelation, remember, especially for the Markov chains, which has correlations with one step of lag. Here we see some, in, in my opinion, ridiculous pictures of autocorrelation, which are not nearly as smooth as what we saw on the previous page. And then finally, the folks who talk about the R hat diagnostic tool said that if R hat is greater than 1.05, that was cause for concern. That did not quite happen here in this relatively simple setting, but this R hat value is pushing closer to 1.05 than what we had on the previous page. To say that all in simpler language, when a MCMC process is good, we should have a, a boring picture to trace, 
our effective sample size should be greater than 0 .0, 0 0.1. The, if we wanted to overlay the density plots, the density plots should, in some sense, agree with each other. The autocorrelation should be relatively smooth. And the R hat value should be close to 1.2. In contrast here, when we have arguably a bad situation, first of all, R itself might tell you it's bad. The trace will look more disorganized. The density overlays will look more disorganized. The autocorrelation will look, in my opinion, broken. And the R hat value will probably be larger for situations that are bad. OK, folks, here in chapter six, we realized that more sophisticated Bayesian models, especially once we go into continuous distributions and multivariate settings, they are so complex that maybe we cannot calculate them um, with formulas anymore. And instead we should use approximations. And it just might be useful to grab approximations anyways to save us on computation time. We learned about two methods the grid approximation, which in computer code is straightforward, but because of things like the cursed dimensionality, we realize it's pretty limited in, in its usefulness. We delved into something called Markov chain Monte Carlo, which itself is seems to be a mathematical oddity at the moment, but the machine learning folks will tell you that the usage of this tool is more flexible. That is, as we apply this to various applications, various word problems, and thinking about notions such as training and testing sets, you want a process that is flexible and will not overfit your data. And then finally, to get a sense of whether or not our MC, MC processes are good or bad, we briefly looked at some diagnostic tools that will help us along the way. Now, I don't know about you, but I am now very curious about actually what MCMC is. So next chapter, we will look under the hood and get a better sense of the MCMC calculations. See you there.